Welcome to the Brass and Woodwind Shop. Every Friday I try to do a video that is interesting and lately I've been doing overhaul projects on various instruments and this is my next overhaul project. How I got to this trombone is somebody drove past my shop and he saw that there was a music store here and he had an old trombone that he wanted to get rid of and he did not have any use for it. He just wanted someone to be able to use it and enjoy it. So I'm going to fix it up and then sell it and then someone will be able to enjoy it. This trombone was made by the Olds Company and judging by the serial number it looks like it was made around 1972. This is a bass trombone. Tenor trombones are the most common and they have a smaller bore size and then the next size up from that is the large bore tenor and a lot of people think that if it has the F attachment on it's a bass trombone but it's actually usually a large bore tenor. Large bore tenor trombones have a larger bore and the bore is 547 thousandths of an inch and that's pretty standard for large bore tenors and then the bass trombone is the next size up from that and it has a standard bore of 562 thousandths of an inch. And usually, but not always, the bass trombone has the F attachment and then a lot of times it also has a second valve on it too. This has the dependent system. If you push down the one trigger, then it will put the instrument into the key of F. This valve only lowers the pitch of the instrument if the sound is traveling through the F attachment. So if you push down only the F trigger, then it will be in the key of F. If you push down both triggers, it will be in the key of G. Another unusual thing about this trombone is there is no tuning slide on the bell section. You can see that these are soldered on and this is one piece from here to here. So you might wonder where the tuning slide is. On this trombone, the tuning slide is on the hand side and that's why there are the two braces there. Here's the tuning mechanism and how it works is these two tubes slide back and forth over the outer slide tubes. That controls how long the slide tubes are. So if you lengthen the slide tube, it lowers the pitch of the instrument. And if you push this in and shorten the length of the slide tubes, then it raises the pitch of the instrument. And it has this mechanism and these adjustment screws so that you can keep it in tune and it doesn't slide back and forth while you're playing it. I can hear many of you asking, why did they make a system like this? And there is a reason and it has to do with acoustics. Most of the tubing on a trombone is a cylindrical and what that means is that the bore size is the same throughout much of the instrument. There is a piece of tubing on the inside of the inner slide tube about right here and it's about this long and actually I have one right here. It's called a venturi and it is tapered. At one end it starts where you put the mouthpiece in. So you put the mouthpiece into that and then it tapers down to its smallest part and then it increases in size until you get to the end and at the end it's about the same size as the bore of the trombone. So if I put this here, you can see that the bore size of the trombone is the same from here all the way through the slide and then into the bell section and then throughout all of the valve tubing up to here and then the tubing starts to taper at this point. So really the only tapered portion of a trombone is the venturi and then the bell from about here up to the end of the bell. I know you're still asking, what does that have to do with the tuning slide and the bell section of a trombone? This is a regular trombone with a regular tuning slide. And over this part of the instrument and this part of the instrument, there's the tuning slide that slides back and forth. This portion and this portion have to be cylindrical because you cannot slide tapered tubing over each other. So on most trombone bell sections, this is the gooseneck and it's a little bit tapered. Then there's a cylindrical section of tubing and then the tuning slide crook is tapered quite a bit and then it is cylindrical again and then the rest of the bell is tapered. So what they did to avoid alternating the tapered and then cylindrical then tapered then cylindrical then tapered portion of the trombone, they made this one so that it's tapered from here to here with no alternating tapered and cylindrical sections. I know what your next question is. If it sounds so much better, why don't they make all trombones this way with the tuning mechanism in the hand slide? There's a simple answer to that question too. There's an extra brace and the extra tuning mechanism and that makes the slide heavier. And now it's not that much heavier, but it is a little heavier. And if you're sliding the slide back and forth all day, you're probably going to feel it after a while. And it does make the slide a little bit harder to control. 
Most trombone players would gladly give up the extra weight on the slide in exchange for tubing that alternates between tapered and cylindrical. One more question I know you're all asking. How much difference does it really make acoustically to have tubing that alternates in between tapered and cylindrical? The answer is probably not very much. I don't think there are very many trombone players that could tell the difference between one or the other. But if someone likes the way this trombone plays, they'll probably be happy to put up with a little bit of extra weight to get the sound that they want. But I don't think that the slide mechanism is going to have much to do with the way that it sounds though. There are two major problems with this trombone and then there are several other minor problems. One of the major problems is the slide. There's a large dent, you can see it from there, and it's bent pretty significantly. This dent goes through the outer side tube and into the inner side tube. So this is a very significant dent, and it's going to be hard to get this straightened out, but it would be very hard to find replacement tubing for this instrument since it has the tuning side in the hand side. So I'm going to have to take what I have and fix that. The second major problem is the cork barrel. It used to be attached to the slide tenon, but it broke off and there are parts missing. And it looks like that someone tried to fix it in the past and they got solder on here. So it's going to be a lot of work. And again, I cannot find this part. So I'm going to have to use what I have and make it work. Those are the two major problems on this instrument. There are a lot of other minor problems. I'm going to take it apart and clean it. And also these valves are very slow and loud, so I'm going to have to fix that too. At first when I got this trombone, I thought that it was not going to be able to be fixed, but then I looked a little closer and all the parts are there. It is missing some metal in between the cracks right there. I don't know what happened. It probably got bent off and then some of the metal just broke off. But this can be fixed. It will be hard to do, but it, it is fixable, so I'm going to do that. And also, this part was on here, and then it slid off of there, or actually it looks like it got unsoldered. So I can clean that up and put that back on there. That is not going to be that hard to do. And the hard part is going to be this dent. I don't think I've ever worked on a dent this bad on a slide. And usually with a dent like that, you would just replace the slide tubes, both the inner and the outer slide tubes. But that's not really an option on this one since these parts are not made anymore. Especially not for a trombone with this tuning mechanism. So because of that, I am going to just work with what's here. And when I am done, this dent will probably not be perfect. But I should be able to get it so that the trombone is fully functional. I know you all want to see me work on the slide, but I'm going to start with the bell section. These valves are a little bit unusual because the spring is underneath the rotor arm. Usually the springs are where the hinge tubes are right here. I'm going to start by removing the levers. First I'm going to take off the screws here and that will loosen up the levers. And then the other one. Okay, now those levers are loose. And like I said, the springs are underneath the rotor arm, so these valves go back and forth even with the lever off. Now I'm going to take out the hinge rod, and the one hinge rod holds on both of the levers. Oh, it looks like that's bent too. You can tell it's bent because when you turn it, the levers start moving back and forth. But that's no surprise that that's bent though. I'll have to straighten that out too. And this screw may be a little hard to get out because it's bent, it's going to want to get stuck on this hinge rod tube. So, let's see, what I'm going to do is from the other end, I'm going to push that out. I'm going to get a small screwdriver to fit in that hole. And then as I'm screwing it out, I'm going to push harder with this screwdriver than I'm pushing with the other one. And hopefully that will get it out, at least to the point where I can uh, catch on to it with the pliers. Okay, it is coming out a little bit. I can probably pull it out with the pliers now without damaging anything. It did not take long to encounter a problem with this. Now, usually when you take apart instruments, you run into problems uh, fairly frequently. Oh, and I see another problem here. This part fell off. I think it's because this is stripped yes so what I'm going I'm going to have to take care of this too this 
screw has been replaced with the wrong screw. So I have a little bit of work to do on that also. But that's the way these instruments work. You run into a lot of problems when you start working on these things. This hinge rod still is being a little bit stubborn. And this pliers, I use this to pull out hinge rods and it works very well because it has smooth and round jaws. So it gets a good grip on it without damaging anything. But you do not get that much leverage with this. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my bench motor. I'm not going to use the bench motor under power. I'm just going to use it to hold on to the screw and then pull it out. I got enough of the hinge rod out, so I should be able to hold on to it with the jaw of the chuck. So what I'm going to do is put it in the jaw of the chuck and tighten that up. And you probably will not be able to see this too well in the video, so I'll try to explain to you what I'm doing. So I'm tightening that up so that it won't come loose. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn this back and forth slowly and I'm pulling as I'm turning it back and forth. Okay, it is coming out and I'm trying not to make it any worse than it was because you can bend it if you're not careful. Okay, I think it's coming out now. Okay, there it is. And if I turn the bench motor, you can see that it is bent pretty severely. So I am going to have to straighten that out. It's pretty obvious where the bend is. It's right there. It's in between where those two levers were. So what I'm going to do is, I don't need the chuck for this. I'm going to put it in up to where the bend is. And then you can see it going up and down right there. So what I'm going to do is take my rawhide mallet. So I'm going to turn this so that the hinge rod is bent upwards right there. And then tap on it. And then I'm going to do that again. Okay. It is better than it was. It still is bent. And I'm just going to keep doing that until it is straight. And once it's close, I'm going to take it out of the bench motor and put it on my jeweler's anvil and see how it is. Okay, that is good. At least it's better than it was. Using the bench motor will get it close. Now I'm going to use my jeweler's anvil and put it on there and hold it up to the light. And I'm going to see where the high spot is. Okay, it's right there. I'm making a mental note of where the slot is pointed. So what I'm going to do now is put this back in the bench motor and I'm going to line it up to where the high spot is and then tap it again. It's a few minutes later and I got the hinge rod straightened out so I'm going to put that off to the side along with the levers. I won't be needing those for a while. I'm going to continue taking apart the valves and rotors are not that hard to take apart. A lot of people are intimidated by them and if you don't know what you're doing you probably should not take them apart but they're really not that hard to do. These ones are different than most though because they have the spring underneath the rotor arm which is, it's not unheard of, but it's unusual. Let's see, I guess I'm going to have to pop that out. That, that does not come off by hand so I'm going to have to pop that out. I made this tool in college and it's used to pop out rotors. It has an end there that will fit into the hole and then you tap on it and it pushes the rotor out. Okay, so I got the rotor out, and there is the, and there, oh, look at that, I wasn't, okay, well, I guess I was wrong, the spring is not under the rotor arm, the spring is be in between the rotor plate and the rotor, and it goes and hooks into a little hole in the rotor. You know what, it's kind of, that. That is very unusual. I've been at this job for 26 years and I don't think I have ever seen that. I have seen this setup before, but the spring was underneath here. But on this one, it's not. It's right there. How this system works is there's a little cutout in the stop arm and that goes around this piece right here. And then when it gets to the end, it stops one direction or the other direction. So that is how that works. And then there's a little rubber ring on there. I'll pull that off. 
because I don't want to lose that. And there's a little rubber ring so that it doesn't click every time it goes back and forth. On this one though, I can tell that the rubber ring is missing. So now that I know what's underneath there, I'm going to take this apart. When the rotor comes out, it pops out the stop arm and it also pushes out the rotor plate from the bottom. So you do both things at one time when you pop out the rotor. Okay, oh, the rubber ring is there, but it's broken, so I'm going to have to replace that with something. I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to replace that with because I don't have these, so I guess I will just have to figure out something. How this system works is the spring goes between the valve and the rotor plate. One of these little notches goes into the hole on the valve. The other one there are three different holes on there, so you can control the tension on the spring by which hole you put it into. So there are the valves. They look like they're in good condition without too much wear, and they're not very dirty either, so I am going to clean them up, but they look like they're in good shape, which is good. Now all that I have left is to pull out the slides, and they may come out easily, or they may not. Let's see, that one is not going to come out easily. And this one, that one also is not going to come out easily. And the draw knob is missing on this, which does make it a little harder to pull out. But I will have to replace that, but I'm going to do that later. To pull this slide, I'm going to use three broken drumsticks. I'm going to put two in there like that. And the third one goes there. I'm going to use some leverage. Okay, there, that came out easily. Sometimes these come out very hard but that was not bad. And if you're going to pull out a lot of tuning slides, I suggest that you make a friend with a drummer and see if you can get all of their broken sticks because you will use a lot of those. So that one is out. Now, let's see. Let's see if I can do the same thing with this. Okay, there, that fits in there. And let's see, that almost fits in there. So I'm going to have to grind that down some more. I'm going to have to take out my grinder and grind down the drumstick a little bit so that it can fit in there. I ground down the drumstick so that it will fit in there. I hope you percussionists who are watching are not insulted by me using the drumsticks, but that's you do what you need to do. I have a box of a whole bunch of wood parts and I use these to fit in between there. Okay, this should work. These are all different lengths of drumsticks or dowels. And I even have Jenga blocks that I use. And what I do is I put the right length in between the two drumsticks. Then I use that between the two sticks for the leverage to pull the slide out. And this is what I have over many years. And every time I need a different length of stick, I'll just toss it in this box. And that's what I have. So now I'm going to try to pull this one out. And there it goes. That also is not that hard. The reason I have so many different sizes of those is if this came out a little bit but it was still stuck, then I would replace this one with a little bit longer one. And then I would pull it out some more and I'd keep doing that until the slide came all the way out. But I think this is just going to come out by hand now. Yep, yeah, there it comes. There are many different methods of pulling stuck tuning slides, and this is the one that I used on this trombone. If it were a different setup, I'd probably use a different system. So just keep in mind, if you're pulling tuning slides, there are many different ways to do that. I do have a series of videos on pulling stuck tuning slides. I'm going to leave the link for the playlist in the description below. There are also other techniques that other repair technicians use, so I suggest if you want to pull stuck tuning slides, watch my videos and also watch other people's videos to see how they do it and do what works for you. This bell section is taken apart as far as it can be taken apart without unsoldering, and I don't think I'm going to have to do any unsoldering on the bell section. I'm definitely going to need to on the slide section, so I think this is done for now. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe for more band instrument repair videos. And next Friday, I'm going to work on the bell section. I'm going to clean the bell section and get some of the dents out.